All right, I muted everybody just so we can start. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to TRG's, I think this is like our sixth or seventh uh, Lunch and Learn, um, but our special guest today is uh, Julie Tran from the South Bay Association of Realtors. She's our government affairs uh, director, uh, more of our uh, local government and state government like liaison. So she'll go over what her duties are to help us as realtors you know, protect our business as well as our clients. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Julie. And she's relatively new to South Bay, but um, she's been involved at CR for a while. So it's all yours, uh, Julie. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Danny, for having me. And I really appreciate seeing everyone, um, either if it's your face or just your name on on Zoom today. Um, there will be segments of my presentation where I'd like some feedback, input, you know, feel free to unmute yourself, Danny, if we can allow people to do that. I think that would be helpful. This is more um, supposed to be a conversation, you know, everything that we're seeing happening at the state level and everything we're seeing happening at the local level, I think it requires every one of us to speak up and and, and share ideas and share thoughts on how things are actually unfolding in your business. So I'd like that to be um, the model for, for this for the session today. So thank you for joining me. I don't know if, okay, good. That works, I can see people. Good, good. <laughs> um, so like Danny said, I'm your new-ish government affairs director and uh, at South Bay Association of Realtors. And prior to that, I spent three years as a uh, field representative for the California Association of Realtors, um, their government affairs program. So it was really my job to go and give these presentations um, to various local associations all across the greater LA area. But now I get to focus on just our South Bay area where so much is happening and things that you know, it may sound like a good idea at the state level may not work out so well for us here in the South Bay in our coastal cities. So that's really been a point of interest. But of course, you know, I really wish we could be getting out there and, and seeing each other and face to face because the, the, this, this FaceTime, I think, is what everyone um, really misses. Um, with that, though, I wanted to start with uh, a, an industry update, kind of, you know, what's been happening in the last six something months of the California legislature being in, being affected by a pandemic, our economy being affected by the pandemic. Wait, give me a little bit. Just eat that one. You've already had four. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll jump right in. Okay. Can everybody see this? Oh, it's paused. Yep, we can see it for you. Yep, we're good. Okay, good, good, good. So this is these slides are really just to keep me on track. Um, but feel free to jump in anytime if you want more clarification on something, um, or if you you know have a comment on on what I'm about to talk about. So the topics we're going to cover today is the general state of the California economy. Um, I'm not an economist, but I do read a lot of economist updates and I keep uh, well informed with our uh, Jordan Levine, who's the uh, deputy chief economist at CAR. Um, and, you know, it's a really good time to just keep tabs on what's happening with our recovery, uh, what shape it's about to form, things like that. Housing legislation at the state level, housing legislation at the local level, we'll touch on those. There's been a lot of movement lately. The uh, budget is still in the works at the state level, so we're going to see um, some strange ideas get pushed through, but hopefully our CAR uh, lobbyists can, can get some of that um, amended. The November election is on our heels, and we're going to be we're going to be looking at some uh, a long list actually of, of initiatives with many of them affecting the housing uh, industry. So more to come on that. I think it's just a really good time more than ever to uh, get registered to vote. <laughs> and then last but not least, I have a little tiny section for tips on brevity, things I learned in the last three months of this pandemic and how to really keep your communication and your message concise, making sure that you're not, you know, you're using people's time and your time wisely things like that. And it's going to be a brief 
little segment. All right, so let's start with the economy. Um, there are two kind of schools of thoughts right now on where our economy will be going at, by the end of this year. Me, the, the general prediction is that we will, we will be seeing a recovery. The question about that is going to be what shape that takes. So um, Chapman University economists have predicted a V shape where the economy recovers very sharply um, with the recovered demand. But the um, for UCLA economists, they're predicting more of a Nike swoosh, where it'll be take where, where the economy will take some time to get back up to its pre-recession, pre-pandemic um, conditions, and it may also never really get there until three years from now. Jordan Levine at CAR predicts more of a J curve, where the initial startup of the recovery will be slow, then it'll give way to a sharper turn. So there is a lot of uncertainty out there, but we do know that GDP is going to be down at least 3.8% to 8.6% this year. Um, and the majority of that loss is going to be due to loss of jobs. Unemployment is going to be high in the 14% 14, 14 by next April in just our LA County alone. Orange County is going to see about 15.4% unemployment and the Inland Empire is going to see about 9.7% unemployment. But the good news is we've kind of hit a bottom um, of this downturn due to the uh, Federal Reserve and the Congress stimulus packages, you know, spending trillions of dollars putting it into the U.S. economy. I think that has really helped us find a bottom to this downturn. Job loss is going to be our most significant and lasting impact from all of this. Um, um, just in L just in California, we're going to lose about 800,000 jobs. And the U.S. as a whole is going to see a job loss rate of about 6.3 million jobs. Uh, even after the rebound this summer, a lot of the jobs, especially in leisure, hospitality, retail, service industries, are never going to come back. So we're, we're facing, you know, people who are already struggling with rent burden who are struggling to make mortgage payments, who are struggling to even, you know, look at the possibility of buying a house, now finding it even more impossible with their uncertainty in their job, um, in, in the future of their jobs, and now with mortgage lenders putting on more requirements to uh, qualify for a loan, such as employer, uh, employer verification, um, mortgage premiums, there are, employer, there are lenders who are requiring you to sign an affidavit to state that you're not gonna be seeking forbearance, so things like that are really going to be affecting your client's ability to get their next mortgage, especially in California. Um, there is a bright spot though. Economists are calling the housing industry in California a bright spot for this economic recovery. You know, we are at record low mortgage rates. Um, the, the economists are predicting we're gonna hit 3.3 percent. Uh, the demand is still very high. Uh, home buyers and uh, current homeowners are finding that this is a good time to buy, and so the demand will still be there. So that leads to the price really staying stable where it is, or even going up in the next year. Um, legislative uh, incentives are there to increase people's ability to move. That includes one of CAR's portability initiative, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But the really the, the, the big threat to our housing stock is always going to be supply. And that's going to be worse by the end of this year um, because we're, we're, we're predicting that home building rates will fall to its lowest levels since uh, 2014. So well below 97,000 units where we need 180,000 units per year. So that gives you a little perspective. Um, on the state side, you no, know, moving through this a little quickly, I just want to go through this so that we kind of have the background in mind before we start discussing. Okay. Uh, on the state side, the budget work on it's moving very fast. Uh, the momentum at the state right now is in headed towards tenant protections. Right. There are a the bevy of bills 
Um, yes, there are some of them are very misguided and not grounded in fact uh, that, that we had to put a stop to. Uh, but we're, we're seeing urge of being stripped away due to legislators having a knee-jerk reaction to, to what's going on with rent burden right now. Uh, so for, I have some bills here. These are just the highlights. There is a list of about 40 bills that are active on the CAR um, agenda right now. The only way for bills to get passed, especially this session, is to be, for it to be attached as a trailer bill to the budget in California. And so that is, that needs to be passed by July. So we're going to see a lot of trailer bills, special interest bills get pushed in. And trust me, the tenant organization, the tennis rights organizations are very, very active and organized. So we are going to have a, a really hard road ahead of us to get some of these bills amended and, and workable. Okay, so SB 1410, that would create a pro for uh, property owners, landlords, to, to make up for the rent, rent that they lost during the COVID crisis. So basically, this is the state franchise tax board assuming debt for um, property owners, for tenants who, who weren't able to pay their rent during this. The allow if a landlord gets some of those costs recovered 10 years for their back rent um, and that would come out of the tenants tax returns so the state's <laughs> franchise tax board is kind of playing middleman here but we see that as a very problematic caveat to to restrict the landlord to having to wait 10 years um, to see you know to, to, to allow the tenant to move move out or um, pay back the rent the so that's still pending that's actually on the, to get voted on, it passed out of committee. Stay watching this. Um, we had a little win last, actually a big win last week. AB 21, 2501 was a red alert bill that CAR had mobilized our key contacts on. And um, this was going to, this bill would have uh, removed or forced mortgage lenders to cover payments for their, for their borrowers uh, if they're, if they were affected by COVID. And there was no, you know, requirement for the borrower to demonstrate how they've been affected financially. It was really just based on their own reporting. The problem with this was the bill had suggested for mortgage lenders to use um, borrowers' impound accounts to pay uh, to pay investors the, the the missed mortgage payments, which you know we all know impound accounts are set aside for property taxes, and they have very finite amount of money in them. Um, this would not have been good for the mortgage industry, and would have been a huge uh, break in the chain for 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 the loan process. Um, it a lot of lenders were looking at this and saying they were going to just put more stringent requirements on mortgages um, in, in the state of California. Uh, investors were going to actually refuse to purchase invest in, in, uh, packages that had any California mortgages in it. And so it really stood to be a, a huge threat um, to turn our whole mortgage industry upside down. We were thankfully able to get that defeated. We removed about 50 votes from that bill in the assembly when it was going through it. So big, big win. The uh, other bright spot that we're working on, of course, is the property tax transfer. This, there's, there's two versions of this. The, uh, the ballot initiative has already qualified for November. That is the one that CAR had gathered 1.5 million signatures for. It's going to allow senior homeowners, 55 and over, to transfer their tax base when they move to a house anywhere in the state. And, um, sorry. I'm, Okay, anywhere in the state and uh, with any price. So that would have in, you know, kind of in, expanded upon Prop 60 and Prop 90. It would have also reformed Prop uh, 58 and Prop 193, the intergenerational inheritance transfer. So that was a point of cont contention amongst a lot of our members. And I realized that because right now, if you give your 
property to your child or grandchild, they would also inherit the property tax base, regardless of what they do with the property, right? This would uh, require them to use it as their primary residence. The issue with this is um, this idea is already floating around in Sacramento. So legislators have introduced their own bills to get rid of this transfer altogether. So this is sort of seen as a compromise that CAR is putting together with the senior relocation uh, property tax transfer to make it kind of even out and put that money back in the housing industry. The, um, this is really good for you to know too. The, the bill would also impact um, victims of natural disasters and homeowners who are disabled to be able to move and take their tax base with them. So there is a legislative alternative to this, that's ACA 11 that is being voted on today um, on, on the Senate floor. So follow that. It has a really high chance of passing. Um, and if it does pass, then we're, gonna, we're, we're not going to be required to do as much campaigning to, to get it passed on this November election. And this is really um, seen as a way to help people move out of their houses, especially during this time where we're going to see supply really get restricted even more because we're not building as much. What does the, the ACA stand for? Uh, Assembly Constitutional Amendment. Okay. So that's how the legislator would, um, the legislature puts ballot measures on the election. So there, those are the two ways. The TAR is kind of approaching it both ways. Uh, another really, really interesting bill that the Assembly is pursuing is in regards to security deposits. Um, they are proposing a bill, uh, AB 3260, to allow alternatives to tenants having to pay the full security deposit. The alternatives could include getting security deposit um, uh, insurance or making those security deposits in in, in, in payments over a six month period. <laughs> so uh, CAR is opposed to this. They are, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to really push back on these more onerous requirements for landlords. Oh, SB 1190, that has to do with tenant termina termination. It would, if it passes, allow for your tenant to break their lease whenever anyone in their family is a victim of a crime anywhere in the world. So you can see already how problematic that would be. Um, it passed out of committee yesterday and it's going to be heard on the uh, assembly floor. So by the end of this week, we're gonna see these bills either actually get killed or um, pass through as a trailer bill and we'll have to deal with it and, and ask for the, the governor to amend or veto. Okay. Commercial rezoning. Uh, this is a bright spot. This is, I want to end on a good note here on the state side. So through the pandemic, we're going to see a lot of big box retail stores, commercial buildings, offices be vacant. Um, then we're going to see buildings, whole buildings at a time go back to uh, being vacant. So the state working with local governments, they are looking at ways to make it, making it easier to rezone commercial areas to create housing and to incentivize local governments to do so because of the projected loss of revenue if they rezone something from commercial to residential, you know, that that's what was the uh, major uh, holdback for locals. So the state is looking at creating grants for local governments to be able to afford to do that. So that's a Portentino bill. The uh, Anthony Portentino is our uh, senator just in the Pasadena area. So he's, he's nearby. I think this is a good one for, for us to get behind. And I know I, through my conversations talking to local elected officials, they really like this. And it's rare to find something that both, you know, the city council members for our beach cities can agree on that they can say the state is doing a good job here. <laughs> so we really want to focus on this one if we if we can get it passed. It has a good chance of passing. Any questions? Want to open it up? Anybody, you feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions. Yeah, like I said, the, the budget will be passed uh, by July. So we're we're hopeful that you know the 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 number of bills that we're trying to get amended or or defeated will will eventually go down.
mobile homes, uh, mobile home parks are also facing rent control at the state level. That's good for you to know. Basically, mm -hmm. right now, the state is, um, is, is dealing with a very heavy hand when it comes to regulating housing providers and uh, builders <laughs> in the state. People are kind of freaking out. All right, so we can go. I think a, a few of our agents saw the new one, the SB 1410. Have you heard about that one yet? Yeah, that's yeah. the, mm -hmm, but the, the 10 years to pay back, back rent. Yeah, it, uh, is CAI, that likely to pass or? <laughs> it just passed out of committee yesterday. Um, CAR is, of course, we're now dealing with the fact that these may pass. So we're trying to get it amended to take away that requirement for, for landlords if they participate in the tax credit program to have to allow 10 years for it. So uh -huh. that, that hopefully will be amended before it actually gets attached to the budget. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's getting a lot of our attention here. And yes, um, Danny had a very good point. If you have existing relationships or uh, you'd like to build relationships with your legislators, either at the state or local level, I'm, I'm gonna talk about some local things happening. Um, let me know, there is always things that we need to be outspoken about just like we just did in the last three weeks. We've actually been partnering up with the Greater LA Association and the uh, Southland Asso uh, Regional Association of Realtors, along with BizFed LA, um, along with AGLA, which is an apartment association of Greater, Greater LA, um, California Apartment Associations, the Building Industries Associations, and uh, BOMA, um, building, building Owners. Uh, and we have been working together to fight these LA city and LA county, you know, overreaching policies. Uh, and it really, it really is proving effective when we get more of us to show up. Um, and especially now, all the meetings are taking place over the phone and it's very easy and not having to go to city count to the city council chambers in LA, you know, pick up the phone, get on, get on their public comment section and, and speak up. So let me know if you're interested in doing that. And then of course, if you have existing relationships with any of the city council members, that would be very helpful for us uh, in, in achieving our goals because those conversations need to keep happening. Okay. So at the local level, we're facing threats. Um, of course, our cities are hurting for cash. There is talk about new local taxes. And the most frightening thing about this is they are looking at um, taxing specific industries. So it wouldn't be just a sales tax. It wouldn't even be just a parcel tax, which we normally would oppose. Um, it would be like an industry tax. Um, so we're, we're, we're keeping close tabs. Carson is gonna be discussing it, I think, in their July meeting. Um, our beach cities, there's moans and groans about it, but our, uh, our, our city council members there have been reluctant to, to create a new tax. Um, it's really the, the non-coastal cities that, that are going to be most affected uh, and, and looking for new sources of revenue. Coastal zone housing permits is an issue that has recently come up on my radar more and more. Um, the California Coastal Commission is now taking over in specific cities that do not have their own planning department, just, such as Hermosa Beach, and they are um, imposing their own requirements and, and, and rules. So, so if you're trying to get a house built in Hermosa Beach, they are no longer allowing you to build a basement. City of Manhattan Beach is restricting your ability to build ADUs at all in the coastal zone. So these are, you know, things that we're we're going to keep keep an eye on. And if you have um, clients who are having a hard time, let me know, uh, and and we can work with them and we can get them the right resources. CARs looking at this. We have a statewide coalition called uh, Smart Coast CA, and they are going into cities that are renewing their local coastal plan to allow you know for for sea level rise because now we're seeing the california coastal commission say you're we don't want you to build seawalls we want you to let the ocean take your property if it comes to it and and that's and that's very problematic um especially for our areas as you could imagine so let me know if you want to be involved in that 
two big, big wins that we had in the last two weeks in LA City has to do with just cause eviction and vacancy tax. So there was a move, there has been a move, and there will continue to be a move to expand just cause eviction and rent control policies everywhere in the state. But LA City has always kind of led the charge here. They were proposing to expand just cause eviction, which means you need to prove a cause in order to evict your tenant, even if they're at the end of their lease. Uh, you need to, and, and right now, cities can only apply just cause eviction to multifamily units. Um, and they have to allow for vacancy uh, decontrol. LA City was proposing to expand just cause eviction policies to all single family rental units, as well as new units and not allow for vacancy decontrol, which is being able to take your, your rental unit back up to market rate if it gets vacated. So we were able, thankfully, to get that delayed indefinitely. They have not reheard that, um, that, that, that item in committee. So that was a big win. We came together, like I said, with our coalition and had the same message and, and reached out to everyone that we could, that we knew on the council. And so if you can help with that, that would be very appreciated. Uh, just yesterday, we finally put the nail in the coffin for a vacancy tax to appear on this November ballot. That doesn't mean it's gone forever. They're going to they're going to try to put it on the November 2022 ballot, but it gives us a little more time to fight it. Uh, the proposal was going to be for six thousand dollars a year per unit if you keep your rental unit empty for at least ten months. So you can imagine. <laughs> um, why the city would do that in the first place. It was going to raise the city about $150 million a year. And our cities are going to be strapped for cash. That's that's going to be um, a big exclamation mark here is how our city is going to come up with new sources of revenue, right? And so we got people together. We communicated um, on public comment and we, we got the vacancy tax delayed. Thankfully. Any questions on that? People can mute them, uh, unmute themselves if they want, right? I'm kind of checking. Yeah, or feel free to type it in the, the chat, whenever it's yeah. easier. Yeah. Yeah, so as you can see, we're, we're dealing with a lot of interesting ideas coming out. You know, vacancy tax has only been implemented in four cities in the world. Uh, Oakland was the one that LA City was very enamored with and tried to model it after theirs. Ted, did you have a question? Yes. Hey, um, you're correct in that the city leads in a lot of these ordinances and, and requirements, but the county is where we're getting affected by most. And I think they follow up with almost the same requirements. And Absolutely. In reference to, and I think that that monitoring of the county is critical. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Everything that passes at the city, the county looks at and vice versa. Um, the county, we have made inroads. They were looking at expanding just cause eviction until the end of the year, expanding their rent control, um, rent freeze until the end of the year. Uh, we got the just cause eviction pushed back, so they're reviewing it on a monthly basis, and that conversation is still, is still going on. But we do have two supervisor seats up um this november election and we're going to be meeting with those candidates again to to communicate where we are you know janice hahn was really really good for us in congress she's not so good for us in in the board of supervisors she hasn't been <laughs> uh the open door she usually is so uh, if anyone has you know a connection with her office i mean i i remember her from my days i used to work for a, a member of congress and so you know, I have some connections with her staff, but she really has moved a lot more to the tenant side uh, when it comes to housing regulation. So we're, we're, we're looking at scheduling a meeting with her in this in summer break to, you know, communicate our points more. So if you're interested in joining in those discussions, I think it would be good to hear um, our side of the story. Yeah. But yeah, we're going to be um, looking at you know more 
more involvement at the local level when it comes to using our PAC money, our political action fund uh, money, where we're and, 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 and being present at the ballot box. So look forward to more communications on that. All right, so speaking about the, the ballot box, we have three big things that, of course, every realtor should know that's going to be on the November 2020 ballot. The split role initiative, that is going to turn Prop 13 on its head. Uh, it's going to split the role of uh, Prop 13 property tax protections and take commercial properties out of that equation. It is titled this is good. This is really important. It's titled to tax on commercial and industrial properties for education and local government. So right away, you're going to see people vote for that based on the title alone. They don't need to know what it does. Um, they don't need to know the effects of it. Uh, so it's really going to be a, a battle for us to educate the public. Because even if they're saying, oh, this, this, tax, this tax increase is really only going to affect the large corporations who have had their properties for um, you know, tens of years, that cost, the, the, they're not, that, that's just untrue. It's going to be passed down through their commercial tenants. Then the commercial tenants are small businesses. They're going to be passing down those costs to consumers. The cost of doing this in California is about to explode. And we're gonna be communicating a lot more on the split rule initiative in the coming months. Um, we, there's already a coalition building uh, statewide to, to oppose this. And I really don't think, you know, it has a great chance of passing, especially in this climate where people are hurting already. And if, you know, if people know that this is another tax increase that will increase their out of pocket expenses every month, people aren't going to vote for it. It requires two thirds vote. So we're hopeful that we're going to be able to push that back, but it has qualified for the ballot. Of course, rent control is always top of mind when there is an election in California. Prop 10 is back, um, this time with a little more of a fine brush uh, ordinance. Michael Weinstein was the author of Prop 10. He's now back at it again to expand local rent control. So of course we know we have the statewide rent control initiative or a uh, measure that's already passed, but now Michael Weinstein wants to expand rent control at the lo local level by chipping away at the Costa Hawkins uh, rental, uh, rental Act. Now, the most onerous part of this is vacancy control. Yes, it would allow for the expansion of rent control to uh, some single family homes uh, for, for, for non mom and pop. You know, if, if you own more than two rental properties, that single family home, this would apply to you. Local governments can put rent control on you. It would apply to units built any uh, after 15 years. Um, but vacancy control is the biggest thing because right now we have vacancy decontrol. And that's the ability, if, even if you have a rent controlled building and someone moves out, you can take that one unit back up to market rate, making it possible for a lot of rent controlled uh, property owners to keep their, their, their entire building on the market. That would get stripped away. And that's really the biggest part of this rent control initiative that people need to know. Okay. And this has qualified for the ballot as well. And there may be a lot of momentum to try to push this through. So um, I would imagine we're going to be spending PAC money to try to defeat this, and we're going to be doing a lot of member education on this. Okay. And the last one, of course, is the uh, California Association of Realtors, the property tax transfer. Again, there are two measures that could qualify. Or this one has already qualified, um, and it would expand the um, senior property tax transfer, disabled property tax, uh, and, and victims of natural disasters. It would reform the inheritance transfer, and it would close the corporate loophole where right now, if you have a corporation transferring um, their, their property in, in, in chunks at a time, um, they're able to avoid a, a property tax reassessment. And so with this, it would close that loophole and make it so that if any corporate property um, transfers by 90% at any given time, they would face a reassessment. And that's gonna make the state some money. The 
biggest difference between this and the the uh, legislative alternative ACA 11 is that ACA 11 would direct some of that revenue, the newfound tax revenue to the fire, the California firefighters funds and, and emergency responders fund. Okay. So we're going to be, we're going to be active this year, everybody. Any questions? That is my unmute if you're ready if you want to talk how do we feel about the state of the state <laughs> like is everybody's I said, content I, <laughs> holding my breath <laughs> holding our breath yeah i do like the um the initiative to rezone because there can be so many more creative properties to sell and rent yeah. so i like the idea of that so much Good, good. I love that. Um, that's something that we're going to be able to get involved in at the local level too. Uh, if you or any, or, you know, or your colleagues do a lot of commercial, let us know. We would love your help in helping the local governments identify those parcels. Cities are looking at funds to buy up commercial par parcels in order to do this. So. That would be good. And even if we turn it into mixed use, you know, that in itself would provide more opportunities for housing. I love that. Okay. Yeah, and um, if any of you guys have uh, know of places in your cities that need, that need, that need help um, cleaning up, after the protests. I know it's been a while, but if there were, you know, storefronts or public areas that have been affected and needs a little cleanup effort, NAR actually has a grant of $3,000 for us to use to help locals, um, you know, fix storefronts, clean up parks, clean up glass. So let me know if you, you know of an affected area. We'd love to be able to use that. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Great job. Thank you. So just a quick thing on concise communication. Um, I learned last week that people, especially during this time, don't have a lot of time, surprisingly enough, right? <laughs> they are bouncing from one Zoom meeting to another, one call to another, and their schedule is very, very packed. And so you really want to say just what you want to say um, and, uh, and answer their question. We we're having a conversation with uh, Assembly Member Al Murasuchi on that mortgage lending bill, and he asked why this bill would restrict the number of loans available to his constituents. How does that work? And we had two very, very informed members who work in the mortgage industry on the call, and they gave him all this background and all this technical knowledge. And it drove him to a point where, he's, where he had to stop us. And he had to say, no, 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 no. I need to know the answer to my question. And so that's what leads me to have this little segment to have everyone ask themselves, you know, are you communicating concisely enough? Are you, putting that i think what happens a lot of time is we put other people in our shoes as opposed to putting us in other people's shoes we say well what i know is so interesting of course they would want to know about the intricacies of the mortgage process where instead we need to say well if i was an assembly member and i am looking at ways to protect my homeowners and this bill seems like a good idea to protect my homeowners how would i be convinced otherwise so having that inner dialogue, I think, would be really important. You know, I, I know for myself, I like to hear myself talk. So sometimes I just need to I'll be aware of that and limit it. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think the easiest thing to, that we've used when we talk to other assembly people and state representatives is that we have to have a story. So if anybody has stories of real life experiences where somebody had a hardship or something happened, that hits better than telling the technical stuff on what's actually being passed. Absolutely. And if you don't have a story, make one up. <laughs> make up an example, Jack and Jill. Yeah, yeah. And it, I think that that skill can be transferred to any conversation you're having. Yeah. So, yeah. 
All right, does anybody have any other questions for uh, Julie? My, my contact information is in the chat. Please reach out to me. Uh, I am always here at your disposal. Working at home makes it very, very easy to track my members and have long conversations with them. Um, if you want to have a virtual happy hour with me, hit me up. All right, well, thank you, Julia, for uh, doing this for us. And if any agents have any questions, they can either send it to me directly to and I can forward it to her or reach out to that contact information uh, below. So thanks for joining us for our uh, Lunch and Learn. Thanks, everybody.